Chad, Lori, can we ask you a couple of questions? Can we ask you where the kids are? Grandparents are very worried about your kids. Lori, everybody wants to know. What happened to JJ? Are the kids okay? Just answer the question. We love Lori. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. She was a good mom. She was a wonderful mom. Loving, doting, caring mom. I have a wonderful husband who is watching our two beautiful children. Lori has five marriages in all. She started talking about this group that she was a part of. This religious group led by Chad Daybell. Chad has written in his books that his visions pierce the veil between worlds. He claimed he was Methuselah and that I was one of Methuselah's wives. He talks about visits from evil spirits, from demons, the end of the world. Her husband Charles said it got stranger. Body camera video showed fourth husband Charles Vallow basically telling police that he feared Lori had lost her mind. She said, you're not Charles. I don't know who you are, what you did with Charles, but I can murder you now with my powers. Charles called and he said, Lori's gone crazy. An investigation spans multiple police departments, different states, and five deaths. Chad's former wife, exhumed. Police end up looking on Chad's property. This is a case involving zombies, evil spirits, two missing children, and a gravedigger's wife. Imagine what a tropical island would look like and what it would feel like. Kauai is exactly that. It's a pretty amazing place. The wedding between Lori and Chad Daybell was in Kauai. That's right. Were you invited? No. I don't think anybody was there except for the two of them whoever performed the services. The photos are great, but the one thing you notice about them is it's only the bride and groom. Seven-year-old son JJ is not there. Neither is 16-year-old daughter Ty Lee. Not at the wedding, not in Hawaii, not staying with friends or family. JJ, say hi. Cops are looking high and low, but they can't find him anywhere. And yet, the wedding goes on. The story and what's happening at this wedding is incredibly dark. The urgent search for those missing Idaho siblings. Officials say the kids have not been seen since September. Good morning, Tom. This is really a mysterious one. The story goes national. Number one, because nobody has seen these kids in weeks. What really drives this story is that the mom is completely silent, which bothers people. It's very bizarre. Why couldn't she just tell? people where they are. Why keep it secret? Chad, Lori, can you tell me where your kids are? Would you tell me what happened to JJ? Can you tell me where Tylee is? Just to see her utter disregard you know, for you know, people's questions. With Lori silent, we reached out to her family to see if they could shed any light on her behavior or the whereabouts of her kids. They agreed to sit down with us early on in the investigation. At the time, they painted a radically different picture than the one the public was seeing. Thank you. Well, I'm Janice Cox and I'm Lori's mother. And I am very much appreciative of an opportunity to say what I know to be true about Lori. She's beautiful, she's sweet, she's kind. She's generous to a fault. Lori and Summer both took dance and they both ended up being cheerleaders. They both love sports. They both played on the softball team that I coached, our church softball team, for three years. Lori was the pitcher and would never let me take her out. It was really sad. She became a hairstylist because she loves help making people look more beautiful. But the most important thing to me is the kind of mother she is the way she dedicated herself to her children. I realize that it looks bad, but I know Lori very well, and I know she would not harm her children or anyone's children. I know Lori, and I know Lori's done everything she can to protect her kids. When I first started talking to her, the first thing she said to me was, Mom, you know me. You know I'm taking care of my kids. 
So the way the family describes it, they describe this as a very close-knit unit, but there is something really weird. They weren't at the wedding because they didn't even know there was a wedding. I don't think I knew that Lori married Chad Daybell until I saw it on TV. To fully understand Lori, I think it helps to go back in time to see how her past relationships may have played a role in her current situation. In the late 1980s, Lori's a high school cheerleader in Rialto, California. She's popular, she's smart, she comes from a devout Mormon family. In 1992, she marries her high school sweetheart. He wasn't my favorite, and we didn't have close relationship. She left home when she was 18, and we asked Lori to wait a year. But they just went off and decided to do their own thing and got married. And so we didn't go to the wedding. There was soon a second marriage, and it's out of this marriage Lori's first child, Colby, is born. We weren't in favor of him, even though he was Colby's father. Hoping the third time is the charm, Lori marries again, this time to Joseph Ryan. You know, they caught people's attention because they were beautiful. They were magnanimous. They were both extroverts. They were, you know, just kind of larger than life. One reason Lori had wanted to get married was to have another baby. So she got pregnant with Tylee right away. And she was really excited about having Tylee. It's during this time Lori makes an appearance on the game show Wheel of Fortune. Gopher, Doc, Isaac, and Captain Stubing. Yeah! And in that clip, Lori describes married life in glowing terms. I have a wonderful husband, Joseph, at home, who is watching our two beautiful children, Colby, who is seven, and Tylee, who is one. Yeah, what do you guys like to do for fun? Uh, we like to play all kinds of sports on our three acres. Okay, sounds like you have a nice life there. We do. Congratulations. Thank nice you. Kid. Lori does not lack her confidence. She was bold enough to get up on stage at a Texas beauty pageant. She's Mrs. Hayes County. Her husband's name is Joseph. They've been married for three and a half years, and they have two children. In 2004, Lori was recruited to do the pageant, and she worked really hard to get in perfect shape. I don't know really what prompted her to want to do the pageant, other than it gave her kind of an outlet. And she thought that might help her marriage at the time. Lori does have stage presence. She's very poised. She did everything beautifully. Tell us who you are. What makes you tick? Being a good mom is very important to me, and a good wife, and a good worker. And being all those things together is not easy. So I'm basically a ticking time bomb. <laughs> Joseph Ryan appears to have been a bit of a ticking time bomb himself. I did witness him uh, be physically abusive toward Colby. He was physically abusive from the very get-go. Now that Wheel of Fortune clip we saw Lorian becomes a lot more interesting because we're able to see how she can portray this illusion of happiness even when her marriage is falling apart. The marriage implodes under allegations that Joe Ryan abused both children. Those allegations were investigated, but never substantiated. This custody battle drags on for years. How are you guys doing? Enter Alex Cox, Lori's brother like no other. I found out Christmas is wrong. Jesus was not born in Bethlehem. He was born in El Salvador. Alex Cox has showbiz aspirations doing cartoon voiceovers as well as comedy on stage. I haven't got a flick of Ian Wabbit's license. He will play a pivotal role in Lori's life. Alex is a key piece to a puzzle that will take investigators months to put together. I'm Alex, and I'm going to be Looney Tunes. Tell me what your impressions of Alex were when you met him. My impressions of Alex was that um, he was a little off and lacked social skills or just maybe didn't really yeah, connect yeah, yeah, with people. I think that's all. What did he tell you about Lori's husband, Joseph Ryan, Tylee's dad? He had told me that there had been some allegations of abuse and that he kind of took it upon himself to 
protect Tylee and Colby and that he had attempted to take Joe's life. Alex got into it with Joe Ryan in a parking lot and assaulted Ryan with a taser in the heart. Alex winds up serving time for aggravated assault. It's another failed marriage for Lori. Enter Charles Vallow, a man who will eventually become husband number four. It's interesting to note Lori's early marriages didn't last very long, but it didn't sour her on the institution of marriage either. I don't know why Lori's been married so many times. I think she has always worn her heart on her sleeve. She thinks that she is trying to help people when she marries them. Can Charles make Lori happy? Can anyone make this mother of two happy? It's like the old adage, mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Mary in Las Vegas. Charles Vallow, to me, was the best of Lori's husbands. They had been dating, and we all liked him. I felt like he was a great husband. I felt like he adored Lori, and that he would go out of his way to make her comfortable, to make her happy. After the wedding, this couple bounces around for a little bit before finally settling in Arizona. Charles and Lori came in, and I thought, well, those are the beautiful people. Lori's protective brother, Alex Cox, also likes Charles. And Charles and Alex were very good friends. They laughed over everything together. Charles loved Alex, and Alex loved Charles. Charles was doing okay for himself professionally. He was a managing partner in a financial investment firm, and he was making $20,000 a month. Money was very important to him, and he was very showy. The big cars, the big trips, the big houses, that was mainly Charles. Lori enjoyed those things, but to her, that wasn't as important as just having a happy family. A happy family. This is a family that blends Lori's daughter, Tylee, and their adopted son, JJ, under one roof. Tylee is the dearest, dearest little girl. You need someone to cuddle with, but you don't have a significant other? Worry no more. She has a tough exterior, but she's got a marshmallow heart. How would you describe the relationship between Tylee and Lori? Lori was who Tylee really loved, and I think she looked up to her mom. Most everyone we speak with depict Lori as a loving, doting, caring mom who will do anything for her kids. JJ is my biological grandson via my son, and Charles is my brother. Charles and Lori adopted JJ, and they let us maintain the grandparents' role. We loved Lori. I'll tell you that right now. I've told everybody. She was a good mom. She was a wonderful yes. mom. He was so fast. He was the fastest little kid I've ever seen. She was a great mom with yes. a special needs child yes. who she took on as her own. Yes. After they started seriously dating, she talked to him about our religion, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And she's been a member her whole life, and we all were. He ended up joining our church. What happens in this marriage is what happens in most marriages. There are good times and bad times. There are financial ups and downs. But for the better part of 14 years, the marriage really seemed to work until it began to unravel. She started talking about this new group that she was a part of. She would bring it up more and more often. And I could see that she was becoming more involved with it and it was kind of becoming more of the focal point in her life. What she had mentioned was the name Chad Daville. He's an author, he's a believer that the end of the world as we know it is coming soon. Daybell has written dozens of these post-apocalyptic, very dark books where he uses what he describes as fictional characters to describe real events, claiming that the future has been channeled through him. And this is the literature that Laurie was reading. So Lori had always been a fan of Chad's books. And so that's how I first heard about Chad from Lori was she would talk about this author that she was really interested in and really connected with his work. She just looked up to him. Right. Kind of like a super fan. A yeah. super fan. I would describe her as a super fan. 
Husband Charles doesn't find it so super. In fact, soon accusations are flying that Lori and Chad are more than just friends. I know she did tell me one time that Charles was accusing her of having an affair. She said it like this. She said he's accusing me of having an affair with Chad Daybell. <laughs> Affair or not, Lori is certainly embracing Chad's teachings, as does Lori's brother Alex Cox. They go on a recruiting trip to spread the word. The word according to Chad. How did she and Alex describe this other thing they were becoming a part of? So what they basically said is that we are here to gather the 144,000 and you are one of them. Did she explain what the 144,000 was? I'm pretty familiar with Revelations, and so I knew what she was referring to. These are the people that will be here at the second coming. It was just too far out there for me. It wasn't something that connected with me on any level. Is it fair to say that Lori had a fascination with death? I would say that's pretty accurate. I think even before she started to exhibit changes in her personality. That was something that was always very interesting to her. At any point when she's talking about all of this, are you thinking in your head, I need to distance myself from Lori? I did. I did feel that way. The Vallow's marriage continues to spiral. Only this time, it's Lori throwing out the accusations. So apparently when she discovered the evidence of this alleged affair. She canceled his return flight. He'd been away on a business trip. She and another friend took his truck that was waiting at the airport from the airport and hid it and took all of his clothes and just threw them away. She told you she took revenge on Charles. She did. Charles Vallow alleges his business bank account has been drained as well. And that's when cops get called. Why don't you come over here? Police body camera video shows Charles basically telling police that his wife has lost her mind. She took all the money out of her bank account today. Wait, what did she say yesterday? She said, you're not Charles. I don't know who you are, what you did with Charles, but I can murder you now with my powers. So she's speaking as a spiritual being. Is she on any medications? No. no. She won't do medications. She says, Has she been to the doctor? No, she won't go to the doctor because she's a translated being, and they would find out she's translated. She cannot be killed. She cannot die. And that's what she thinks? Yes. Lori tells you, I believe, that she is a translated being. Did she actually use that phrase with you? She had told me that she was a being that had lived on several worlds. Sounds like she's describing herself as a deity or godlike. Exactly. It was very much like a self-deification, elevating herself above everybody else. So the next morning, Charles called real early in the morning. And I answered the phone and he said, Janice, Lori's crazy. She's gone crazy. Charles gets a court order to have Lori committed for a mandatory psych evaluation at a mental health facility. But a few hours later, she's discharged. Charles is desperately trying to get the Cox family to see that something is not right with Lori. When this situation doesn't improve, he takes his problems to an attorney. You know, I've been a divorce attorney for 30 years, but I've never had anybody that came in that was this specific, that said, I'm afraid I'm going to be murdered, and this is who's going to do it, and here's why it's going to happen. Charles makes that same claim in his divorce filing, and also reports it to police. He told me that Lori told him that she was going to have him killed, that he was in the way, and that she had an angel that would dispose of his body after that took place. And Charles was very adamant with me that he wanted to make sure that I let everybody know that if he was killed, that it was Lori who did it. Could it, be? it wasn't that long ago that the Vallows were deeply in love. After a brief but failed attempt to reconcile, Charles now has two problems. Number one, Lori doesn't love him anymore. And number two, neither does brother Alex. What is the emergency? Uh, I, I shot my brother-in-law. The reason Charles Vallow goes to the house that day to his estranged wife's home is to pick up his son JJ to take him to school. Now, Alex Cox was there supposedly to make sure this handoff went smoothly. It did not go smoothly. And was he armed also? Or just... Yeah, he, he came at me with a bat. 
anyone been drinking or doing drugs or anything today? Or no? I, I don't know, but I've never seen him that enraged before. Okay, what part of his body is injured? In the chest. Okay, is he awake and responsive or unconscious? Unconscious. The 911 operator instructs Alex Cox how to do CPR. Make sure you're still pressing down at least two inches into this chest, and it comes up with each compression. One, two, three. And you hear this heavy breathing on the phone. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Five, six, seven, Jim, so do you have the uh, subject on the phone step out of the residence? You know, no weapons? No weapons on me. All right, come on out this way. Yeah. Oddities. There are a few at this scene. Uh, you have some ID on you, sir? Yeah. Alex Cox is supposedly performing CPR on a guy that has two bullet holes in his chest. And that is going to be an incredibly messy and bloody business. But when the police get there, when you look at the footage, he doesn't appear to have any blood on his body at all. He was just yelling at me. He came at me with a bat. Okay. Was he living here or no. visiting? Alex Cox claims to have suffered a blow to the head from the bat swung by Charles, yet he declines medical attention. Let me see your head. You got a laceration. You want me to call paramedics? No, I'd really like some water, though. Supposedly, Charles hit him in the head with a baseball bat. First of all, Charles played baseball his whole life. He was strong. If Charles would have hit somebody in the back, there'd be gray matter and blood everywhere. I mean, look, in traumatic situations, everybody reacts differently. But here's this guy that just took a human life who's sitting on the curb, and Alex doesn't appear to be distraught at all. And he even starts talking about the weather and complaining about the heat to the police that respond to the scene. Is this hotter for you? That's layers. The next oddity involves not who's in the house, but who isn't. Chandler, police department! Anybody inside? Make yourself known! Chandler, 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 Chandler. Uh, no, I think she's uh, taking her son to school. Alex says it's only been five minutes since the shooting, but he's already alone at the house, which means Lori and daughter Ty Lee, the only two other witnesses to this, have already left, which means they left almost immediately after the shooting which is weird. So, wife who lives here, her daughter, her son, they all leave. I was a little bit surprised that they had left and come back. The decision to prioritize taking JJ to school rather than wait for the police to come as your husband is dying on the floor becomes even more bizarre when they stop at Burger King to get JJ food. Chicken fries and the Sprite, because that's what he ate every morning because that's the routine and that's what he likes. And she took him to school and then they came back. Hi, who are, are you? Okay, just stand over there for just a second, guys. Mother and daughter are also very composed when they arrive back at the scene. Do you have a driver's license? Click the act this crap. There wasn't any huge outwardly signs of like emotional distress. There wasn't tears. There wasn't anything like that. They seem pretty put together. Like, Hi, neighbor. Sorry. <laughs> Lori and Ty Lee are taken to the police station to give their statements. Alex has driven separately to provide his. No handles on the inside? Yeah, no, that's how those police cars are, you know? When detectives are finally able to sit all involved down at the police station, uh, this trio outlines the story of self-defense. That morning and that Charles came over and took JJ out to the car, ready to go to school. According to Lori, this squabble begins over a cell phone. Charles gets outside and realizes that he's left his iPhone inside the house, so he goes back in to retrieve it. Charles's cell phone was on the kitchen counter, so she had retrieved the phone, and that's where the argument ensued. She describes him as being extremely angry, never seeing him like that, and that she's now wanting to know what's on the phone that he doesn't want her to see. Tylee came from the bedroom with a bat and basically circled around them and is standing next to mom. Alex says that Charles ripped the bat out of her hand. He said that he saw Charles basically go forward towards Lori and Tylee, and that's when he grabbed him from behind, and they basically pulled him back, and they ended up on the ground. 
So after the altercation, he basically says he goes to his room where he gets his gun. Lori explains that there's a tussle between the two of them, and Tylee describes that as well. Neither of them really remain in there. They both kind of evacuate out during kind of this physical exchange between Charles and Alex. Lori directs Tylee basically out because JJ's outside. He tells Charles to drop the bat. Charles basically says, what are you going to do? And he said, Charles just kept coming with the bat. Alex says he shot him in self-defense. And he said, I didn't have any other choice. That's what he told me. I said, how are you feeling? He said, Mom, I feel terrible, but I'd do anything to protect Lori and Tylee. Charles had never been violent with anybody, so you kind of start getting a bigger picture of this just doesn't feel right. Both of us have driven people home after interviews, and this would be at the top of bizarre for me, the whole car ride. The odd part about it was just the, the complete lack of emotion. It was a very nonchalant. Um, Lori had a big smile on her face. The case like this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. The case is just beginning. In a word, detectives find all of this odd, but odd is not a felony. Now, being weird and not making sense is going to make the investigation continue. But they better hurry because Lori is off to Idaho to land husband number five. T-Mobile is upgrading its network at a wreck. My last name is Vallow. Copy uh, several gunshot wounds. He was able to see his own demise. You lost your brother. Yes. He and I were extremely close. We don't know what JJ saw. We don't know what Tylee saw. I am Tylee's aunt and Joseph Ryan's sister. As Tylee's advocate, I need to chase down the truth. I need to turn over every rock I can possibly find. When we were finished with the search warrant and we left, that's the last contact that we've ever had with them. Yeah. They've never called, asked questions. Charles Vallow told me that he had a million dollar life insurance policy on his life. Lori Vallow was the beneficiary. The wife just showed up. And when we have allegations here that Lori was directly saying that she was going to murder Charles, that's a problem. The next time I talked to Charles, he told me that he had changed the beneficiary to Kay Woodcock, his sister, because he trusted her to give the money to JJ. The party's over. Lori didn't know that he had removed her from the policy. After the shooting of Charles, Lori did just, you know, up and move to Idaho pretty quickly after that. We know that the landlord asked her to move out by the end of August. And now she didn't have her meal ticket or the million dollars. And they moved to the promised land of Rexburg, Idaho, in the company of Mr. Chad Daybell. Rexburg has always been a strong, faith-built community. Very trusting, where neighbors love each other. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is very large in this area. And Rexburg is once again one of the safest communities in Idaho. If Lori had designs on Chad, things are about to get really interesting when she moves to Rexburg. Because Chad is married to someone else. Facebook photos show Chad and Tammy as a happy couple. Chad and Tammy moved here about five or six years ago with their family. In his memoir, Living on the Edge of Heaven, Chad Daybell describes being called to Rexburg. He writes, a voice said, moving to Rexburg will be a tremendous blessing on your children and your grandchildren. What I remember of them is a perfect couple. Good mom, good dad, good kids. 
Tammy is a real spitfire, though. She had a mind of her own, and she was not one that was easily walked on. Chad Daybell and I served as missionaries for the LDS Church back in the late 80s. Chad was the most humble missionary that I ever knew. While Lori and Chad have been known to attend LDS services, Chad has also written books and lectured on his own personal beliefs, which are distinct from LDS theology. Chad was the author of these doomsday books that had a peculiar prophecy about the end of the world and how people should prepare for that. His books are all about the end of times and dying. His visions deal with dying. When Chad lived in Springville, Utah, he was a grave digger. Chad was the cemetery sexton before he resigned. A few years ago, Chad wrote his autobiography, and it gives you a glimpse of the way this guy thinks and what he believes. In his memoir, Chad Daybell writes, I don't fictionalize any of the events portrayed. My torn veil allows information to be downloaded into my brain from the other side. The scenes I am shown are real events that will happen. He was gathering people to Rexburg. They were moving there because Chad Daybell said, this is where you need to be. We don't yet know the full size of this group, but what we do know is that at the very least, Lori Vallow and her family relocated to this area. At first, everything in Idaho seemed to be going smoothly for Lori, Ty Lee, and JJ. JJ, already making new friends, is seen playing outside on a neighbor's doorbell camera. They played every day almost, until he said he was moving to his grandmother's. Thank you. There was three FaceTimes after Charles's murder, the last one being 35 seconds. He said a couple little things, and then it, you could see his eyes look up, and... He was looking at somebody? He's looking at something else, Not and he goes, directly. I gotta go, I gotta go, bye, and then, and then boom, it was just that fast, it was gone. And that that's the last time... We saw him. Or heard from him. Or heard. You were in communication with police and investigators because you wanted to find oh, JJ and Tylee. Yes. In September, I believe we learned that they moved to Idaho, but I still didn't have an apartment number. She and Chad together, they just feed off of each other. They were actively preparing for the end that was inevitably coming very soon. And what was she doing, according to her, to prepare for that? Storing medical supplies, storing food, water, all the things that you would need if you weren't able to access them for whatever reason. So she planned on surviving the end of the world? Yes, because she was one of the 144,000. Their mission right now is to gather the 144,000 that will be left here on Earth after the doomsday being July 2020. Do I see him as drawing people to him? Yes. Chad's message is what draws people to him, that Jesus is coming again and that we need to prepare. I'm an author and podcaster, Chad Dable published my first five books. Chad Abel did try to say that we'd been married before. He claimed he was Methuselah and that I was one of seven of Methuselah's wives. And he named some other women. Did she ever mention that her kids were among the 144,000? She never said one way or another about the kids. Within seven days of Lori moving to Rexburg, she takes a trip to Yellowstone Park with Tylee, JJ, and her brother, Alex. Authorities say no one ever saw Tylee again after that point, after that very last photo with Alex and JJ. When I found out about Yellowstone, what? Did Lori take JJ one direction and Uncle Alex take Tylee another? I don't know. I don't know what happened. Weeks later, yet another one of Lori's family members has a bizarre run in down in Arizona. 911, where's your emergency? Um, someone just shot my window.
Alex's curious connection to all this, and you've got a lot of drama, especially when police are called in to investigate a 911 call involving yet another family member. Where's your emergency? Um, someone just shot my window. Okay, someone shot uh, at your vehicle? Yeah, and it hit my window, shattered my driver's side window. Okay. Sorry, I'm a little off breath. They just... And what is your name? My name's Brandon Boudreau. Brandon Boudreau was married to Lori's niece, Melanie, when that shot rang out. Private Eye, Rich Robertson, is hired to help sort out the mystery. Brandon called me and seemed to be kind of in a panic. He was obviously agitated, uh, and he just started spewing out all this information about being the target of a shooting and just a uh, crazy story. I wasn't sure what to make of it. Brandon told me that as he pulled up near his house toward the driveway, he recognized the Jeep that was sitting in the street with the Texas license plates, and he thought he recognized that to be the Jeep that Charles Vallow had. Charles Vallow did indeed own a Jeep Wrangler that was registered down in Texas, but dead men don't drive. So who was inside the Jeep? As he approached, he saw what he believed was Alex Cox reach out the back of that Jeep, the window where the tire had been removed, and shot at his car. Alex Cox, as in Lori's brother, a man who's already shot one, assaulted another. Could this guy be a drive-by shooter as well? It struck the frame on the window on the driver's side just over his head. As soon as that hit his car, he just accelerated and got past the Jeep to try to get away from it. Alex just is straight up and admits to anything. He's just a man of truth. And I remember having that uncomfortable, you know, question that I go to him with, you know, did you take a shot at Brandon? And he, he said, no, he joked about it. He's a comedian. And he said, Melanie, me in a recognizable car with, you know, a, right across the street, and I'm a great shot. It didn't add up. One thing Alex was not was a liar. Alex was very honest. And Alex would always say, if you called him on something or asked him if he did something, he immediately owned up to everything he did wrong. Police say there's no denying that a bullet was in fact lodged in Brandon's vehicle. But why would anyone want to kill him? In court filings, Brandon says he can think of a million reasons. Brandon believed that if there was a motive to kill him, it would have been for a million dollar life insurance policy that he had, which Melanie would have been the beneficiary. It's just not true. It's just a fight of trying to make me look bad and accuse me of things I haven't done. Police haven't announced one way or the other who was the shooter that night. And Melanie denies having anything to do with the shooting and has not been charged. Brandon knows me and knows I wouldn't do that. It did start out for me as a very specific kind of assignment to find two people and a vehicle. And then realized that what I was seeing was this small group of people in Arizona start moving to Idaho. And in Idaho, there will be another spouse on the wrong end of a gun. And a fateful call between Lori and Chad. Hello. Hello. How do we ensure families facing food cooperating with the police? If you have any information, we want both of the children back. It relates to the beliefs that Lori and Chad hold as part of this new church called the Church of the First Born. According to police, Chad and Lori had spoken to others about dark spirits, even zombies, and what seems a bizarre mission. Their mission is to rid the world of zombies. <laughs> Police are in the process of re-examining every one and everything with a connection to Chad. Our crews here at the cemetery were here at 6, 6.30 in the morning. Even exhuming Chad's dead wife. The whole country became obsessed with this case. Where were JJ and Tyler? 
We all wanted to talk to Chad and Lori. Hey, ask you where the kids are. Are the kids okay? No comment. It's a simple question. Just answer the question. Looking on Chad's property. What did they find? They gridded off these areas and they start peeling away layers. Are you okay? And we all know what that search would reveal. Who is responsible? One morning, you're going to wake up and say, oh, my God, what have I done? Rexburg is a beautiful, safe place. Safe as any city built near an old volcano. Its motto is America's family community. And this is where Chad and his wife, Tammy, are raising their family. And then Laurie came to town. Maybe an eruption was inevitable. Chad's wife, Tammy Daybell, returns home after a long day at work. And this 49-year-old librarian is taking stuff out of the back of the car when trouble comes up from behind. Tammy would later post on her Facebook page, a guy with a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad and he ran off around the back of my house. I have no idea what his motive was and we never spoke even after I asked him several times what he thought he was doing. So Tammy Daybell stares down the barrel of a gun and manages to survive. But just 10 days later, she winds up dead. The obituary says that she passes away due to natural causes, but at the time, she's actually training for a marathon. It's hard to accept her death. I don't believe it. Husband Chad declines an autopsy before Tammy is buried in Utah, and he receives a $430,000 life insurance payout. I did see Chad that morning, and... He receives a $430,000 life insurance payout. I did see Chad that morning, and I don't know how he was grieving. If he was, I do know that he didn't show a lot of emotion. Honestly, I think if I were 49 years old and my wife died unexpectedly at night, I would have asked for an autopsy just to see if there was some medical reason that might be passed on to my children or whatever. But I don't know why that wasn't done. I think that is very unusual and causes suspect. It seems like everywhere Lori is, people yeah, are either dead or missing. Yeah. Kay Woodcock and her brother Charles were pretty close. They shared a lot of things, including his online passwords. I worked for him a little bit, so he gave me all of that information. In a way, it helped jumpstart an investigation into what happened, correct? You saw some things on a computer? Yes. And what did you see? I saw emails. That email account was linked to the Amazon account. Lori was ordering from the Amazon account still. So I clicked on those and boom, there I see the address they're at in Rexburg, Idaho. Apartment number, everything. The online information that Kay finds is key because now we have an address to where Lori is and a door for the cops to knock on. It also reveals something else. Lori purchases a ring on Amazon under Charles Vallow's account, a wedding ring. And it is this ring that turns up in her wedding photos to Chad Daybell. How does a mother who up until seemingly a few months ago loved her children, seemingly would do anything for her children, how does she do a 180 like that? I think that she and Chad together have just, you know, that like they, they just feed off of each other. I know she knows right from wrong. Just admit that. Chad, just admit that, Laurie. This is nothing about religion. There's no way you can make me believe that in their heart, they honestly believe this BS. 
one morning you're going to wake up and you've, you've got to look at yourself in a mirror and say, oh my God, what have I done? That day is coming sooner than Lori and Chad know. On November 5th, Lori and Chad are on the beach getting married. But police are methodically uncovering evidence, evidence that suggests foul play. And it all ties back to the newlyweds and Lori's brother, Alex. Evidence like that ring on Lori's finger. You see, the receipt from Amazon shows that it was purchased before Chad Daybell's wife, Tammy's death. After the wedding, the couple returns to Rexburg, Idaho, but the honeymoon is officially over the moment detectives show up to conduct that welfare check requested by the grandparents. And that's when things really started getting weird. Detectives speak to Lori's brother, Alex, and Chad. According to police, even though Chad had just married Lori, he acted like he didn't know her very well. I asked Mr. Daybell for Lori Bellow's phone number and he stated he didn't have it. I found it suspicious because I knew that they were married two weeks prior to my contact with Mr. Daybell. Brother Alex says JJ is fine and with grandparents in Louisiana. Of course, that is a lie. I told Mr. Cox that was unlikely because uh, Kay was the one who originally called in the welfare check. This shell game being played by Lori, Chad, and Alex is designed to distract and deceive. And to a certain extent, it's actually effective because as the clock keeps on ticking and time goes on, it's less and less likely that these children are ever going to be seen again. Rexburg police eventually catch up with Lori at her townhouse. And when she's talking with them, she allegedly lies, telling them that JJ is with her friend Melanie Gibb. When in actuality, Melanie Gibb has no idea where JJ is. According to Rexburg police, once they leave, Lori doubles back and calls Melanie Gibb. And she tells her, hey, Rexburg police is about to call you. I need you to tell them that JJ is with you. This really confuses Melanie. She's put on the spot. Melanie does tell police JJ was never with her. With police closing in, Chad and Lori take off the very next day and they head back to Hawaii. Alex, on the other hand, goes in a completely different direction. He decides now would be a great time to attend a wedding, his own. He picks up his girlfriend, Zulema, and they head off together to Las Vegas. I am Sebastian Salas. I am the owner of A Chapel of Love. I have personally officiated over 100,000 weddings, and I booked the wedding of Alex Cox and Zulema Pestenis. Zulema is a spiritual woman and life coach who claims that her clients will learn that there's a divine power working magic in their lives. Zulema was the one that coordinated and paid for everything. It was all Zulema. At the chapel, Alex demonstrates a little bit of magic himself, making his last name disappear and taking on the last name of his new bride. Alex took Zulema's last name. It was, uh, it was pretty funny. I'm not gonna lie. I have never seen that. That was the first time I'd ever seen a groom take the bride's last name. This is an amateurish attempt by this guy to get the police off his trail, essentially. He's adopting the name of somebody else because it's gonna be tougher for the police to track him down. So in his mind, what he's doing is he is, he's erasing his tracks. This ceremony was about as romantic as a trip to the DMV. Ceremony lasted about three and a half minutes. Alex was quiet, wasn't very involved in the process, and Alex wasn't too eager to add anything onto his package, like flowers for his bride, or even have a picture taken of his wedding. I just wanted to uh, simple, short and sweet, get married and be out of here. The couple returns to Arizona where the newly minted Alex Pistenis begins his new life. Meanwhile, Chad and Lori are secluded in Hawaii when they get a call from their friend Melanie Gibb, 
Now, Melanie has questions and Melanie wants answers. So she comes up with this idea to call Lori and record her and get her to admit that she asked Melanie Gibb to lie. The audio from that phone call is later released by authorities. Hello, sweet Melanie. Hi, Chad. Hey, Lori. Melanie's a little awkward. She doesn't know how to confront Lori, but she says, hey, I want to talk to you about what you asked me to do the other day. I want to talk to you about that lie. Well, I was wondering why you told the police why he was with me. <laughs> I just needed to have somebody that I, so I wouldn't have to tell them where he really was because they were going to tell Kay where he is. Is JJ safe? He is safe and happy. In the phone call, you get a little bit of insight into Lori's world. You're either for her or you're against her. And once Melanie Gibb starts questioning Lori, Lori puts her sort of in this category, you're against me. Never had any idea that you would be the person of all people to turn me. I cannot believe I'm asking questions and I am concerned for you. That is what somebody does when they care. You don't sound like you're concerned. You sound like you're accusatory. You do not sound concerned. You sound pissed off. Rexburg police at this point take a trip down to Utah to this cemetery where they are going to exhume the body of Tammy Daybell. They're in the process of re-examining every one and everything with a connection to Chad. It was kept quiet. It wasn't a media circus. It was very quiet. Our crews here at the cemetery were here at 6, 6.30 in the morning. There were no onlookers with the exception of a dozen people from the attorney's office, Rexburg Police Department, several people from the coroner's office. Everything was photographed. And uh, believe it or not, Tammy was back and buried within six or seven hours that same day. It's interesting that Tammy used to sell to cemetery plots out here and keep the records of the cemetery. And, and now we're here doing an interview. It's. Uh, Kind of mind-boggling if you really want to think about it a little bit. One day after the exhumation, there's a 911 call, and once again, it involves Alex Cox. 911, where is your emergency? Um, I have uh, a older male here named Alex. I think he's passed out. It's really bad. Come up there. Let me back. Um, I have a older male here named Alex. He's uh, he just passed out here on the on my on my bathroom. So death to us part came a little earlier than expected, and just two weeks after getting married, Alex Cox collapses in the upstairs bathroom of his new bride's home. Zulema's 25-year-old son Joseph calls 911. Is he awake hey, right hey. now? He's passed out. Okay, you think he's unconscious? Yes. Yeah. And now the tables are turned. Instead of Alex dialing 911, a 911 phone call is actually being placed about him. Well, Alex. Alex. He's not, he's not breathing. Zulema's son is seemingly unaware that Alex is now his stepfather. Do you know him? No, it's my mother's boyfriend. And he doesn't even know Alex's last name. Alex's last name. I don't know. You don't know his name? No. Five minutes into the call, Zulema arrives home. And Joseph starts to tell her what happened. It's really bad. Come up there. Give me back. Paramedics arrive and rush Alex to the hospital where he's pronounced dead. He is only 51 years old. The moment I found out Alex passed, I had gotten a phone call from Zulema and she was just in shock and I immediately just broke down like it felt like I'd lost my best friend. 
how could I ever trust somebody the way I trusted Alex? He was like a vault. And his secrets are locked in that vault. So you got this guy who kills Lori's husband, although he says it's in self-defense, and then he's being looked at in the disappearance of these two children, and now he's dead. There's been a lot of false claims that he's a hitman or um, the family killer, and it's just, it couldn't be f further from the truth. Alex has and had a big heart, and he was a man of his word, a man of truth. And police are trying to find the truth about how he died. Zulema told police that Alex was suffering from shortness of breath. And the night before he died, she'd urged him to go to the doctor, but said that Alex had refused. But ultimately, the medical examiner would rule that Alex's death was due to natural causes. Alex is a mystery in life and in death. In fact, his own mother didn't even know he died for seven days. And then we learned later that she didn't even know he'd been married. Sadly, regarding Alex and Zulema, I didn't know they were married until after he died. I didn't know that they had moved back to Arizona. About Alex's death, we had him cremated, which were his wishes, and we had a service for him. And we didn't invite anyone to his service that believed he was a murderer. So it was a very small, precious group of us who loved him. On December 20th, 2019, Rexburg police and the FBI issue a press release announcing that JJ and Tylee are missing endangered children. And that is when the story goes national. Now two authorities intensifying their search for two missing children in Idaho. First two missing children and now their mother and her husband are both believed to be on the run. Give me another one, JJ. By January of 2020, JJ has been missing for more than three months. Larry and Kay turn to the public for help. The grandparents of a missing Rexburg child have upped the ante in the search to find him and his sister. They hold a press conference and they announce a $20,000 reward for any information that will lead to finding JJ and Tylee. If you have any information whatsoever, please call the authorities. We want Lori to please start cooperating with the police but she's not going to start cooperating, so the police are going to have to force her. The new developments involving missing siblings from Idaho, their mother, but not the children, has been found by authorities in Hawaii. On January 25th, Chad and Lori are located in Hawaii by police, and Lori is served with a court order telling her she's got to produce JJ and Tylee within five days. That moment was caught by police body camera. The deadline comes and goes without a peep from Lori. They gave that mother until tonight to reveal her children's whereabouts. But Lori fails to produce the kids. And the mystery continues. Larry and Kay head to Rexburg, Idaho. JJ's last known address. Come on, Kay. Let's just walk down. I can see him running around here. I know how he is. If that door would open and, and he would holler, Papa, I think I'd die of a heart attack. East Idaho News obtained surveillance footage from a storage facility in Idaho. It shows Lori and a man who looks a lot like Alex making multiple trips to the storage locker in the weeks after JJ and Tylee disappear. Police search the storage locker and they find a scooter, they find a backpack with JJ's initials, and they find a photo album with photos of JJ and Tylee. What did you think when you saw that? It was like somebody reached into my heart and stomped on it. It, it was like a kick in the gut. Chad and Lori, can you tell me where your kids are? Lori and Chad go on what with their lives. Me? Our producer spotted them on their way to church service. Would you tell me what happened to JJ? You know, the grandparents are very worried. The couple doesn't seem too concerned about the outrage that they're enjoying life in paradise while Lori's kids are missing. Lori, tell us where your kids are. Everybody wants to know. Five 
five months since JJ was last seen. And now, finally, Lori is arrested. Kauai police say they have arrested Lori Vallow on an Idaho warrant. Lori Vallow was taken into custody without any incident by detectives of the Kauai Police Department. Lori's charged with two felony counts of desertion and non-support of dependent children. And she is held on $5 million bond. My name is Marcus Moore with ABC News. A few days later, after Lori's arrest, ABC News correspondent Marcus Moore tracked Chad down. My initial goal was just to introduce myself and to convey that I have no preconceived notions. Is there, is there anything that you would like to say to people at all who are, number one, concerned about the kids or concerned about you uh, and your wife? Anything at all you want to say to them? Just grateful for any support. We just have to wait for the legal process to work through. And, and can you tell me, Mr. Daybill, are, are the kids go. are the kids okay? No comment. Okay. I will never forget just how nice and approachable and seemingly disarming Chad seemed uh, in that moment. Lori leaves Hawaii in handcuffs. She's extradited back to Idaho, where she and Chad reunite in a packed courtroom. All right. Chad has not yet been charged with any crime, but it is only a matter of time before he will join his beloved behind bars. Police will tell you that when Alex Cox died, a lot of secrets died with him, except one. And it's been hiding all along on his phone. We've been covering this story for so long, and throughout every iteration, the question always remained the same. Where are the kids? I think for the public, they wondered why were Lori and Chad allowed to walk free for so long? And now we finally understand why. Investigators needed time. When you look at the affidavit, you see how much work they put into this to try to piece it all together. Is that standard to let people go about their business while the investigation's underway, even if they think murders took place? Yes, and mainly they let that happen because they'll make mistakes typically along the way. They'll make phone calls. They'll go bury something. They'll get rid of a piece of, of evidence. Investigators were able to put together a timeline of sorts. So give us a sense of what law enforcement now believes happened so what happened is that local law enforcement got the FBI involved, and, and rightly so. They bring a lot of support to a case. And there is a team of our unit in the FBI called the Cellular Analysis Survey Team. Now what that is, is that they are very good at precisely marking where your phone has popped up. And it's actually so good that they can put it roughly about 20 feet from where you are. So it's, it's really cool stuff. And so that cell phone location allows for police to really put the pieces of the puzzle together. You can place Alex in Lori's apartment at wee hours in the morning. And then the next thing you know, a few hours later, Alex's phone pings behind Chad's house. It allows investigators to understand where that phone was traveling and then extrapolate from there. Now, you can't say this was Alex the entire time with this phone. You don't know that for certain. But when you start adding it up, you say this is his phone going from place to place. Then the phone goes back to his apartment. And for investigators, it leads and others to say, who else could have done this? You don't know for sure but you are sort of making that extrapolation. Tylee, the last she's seen is on September 8th. She disappears. Alex goes over to the apartment early morning hours of September 9th. This evidence is fascinating because it's the only time that Alex's phone is at any period in time in Lori's apartment between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. Then at about 9.30, the phone pings from Chad's property towards the East End. Then there were the text messages from Chad Daybell at around this same time, correct? Right, according to the affidavit, 
a short time, perhaps, after Alex had left the property, Chad then texts his wife, Tammy Daybell, saying, hey, there's something interesting going on by, back by the pet cemetery. There was a raccoon, and I had to end up shooting it, and then I buried it in the pet cemetery. He also mentions burning some stuff in the fire pit. I think he made an excuse that it was going to get wet or whatever, and he wanted to get rid of it. Was there ever a raccoon discovered buried on Chad Daybell's property? No. Let's talk about Lori, about two weeks later, September 22nd. What is she saying, Ryan, to her friends at this point about her children? Well, she's talking about JJ, and she's frustrated. She allegedly mentions to her friends that she thinks JJ has become a zombie. And she uses as proof of that the fact that he's watching TV while he's sitting still and that his vocabulary is increasing. And that's proof that he's in a zombie-like state? Yeah, that this isn't the JJ that she knows. And investigators say that this isn't the only time she's mentioned zombies and her children. Investigators say they have other witnesses who heard Lori Vallow refer to her children as zombies. Right, and this becomes key when you talk about zombies in this context. It's, it relates to the beliefs that Lori and that Chad hold as part of this new church called the Church of the Firstborn. Zombies are these people who are always considered to have dark spirits. They were no longer seen as human beings. They were seen as zombies. And so what that does is it tees the ball up in her mind, expressing to other people that these kids are now bad and that who they were, who Tylee was, who JJ was, are not anymore. She's saying her kids have been possessed. Right. Her kids are possessed. Right. Maybe look at it this way that they have created a different reality. On September 22nd, that very day that Lori was complaining to her friends, something happens. Alex comes over, yes? Alex comes over to the apartment, he takes JJ, he has him for a while, brings him back early that evening. There were house guests there. And so the next day, the house guests get up and there's no JJ there. So they say to Lori, hey, where's JJ? And Lori allegedly tells the house guests that JJ was acting up. So Alex came back over and took him back in the middle of the night. And then JJ is never seen again. And in this particular story, investigators were able to use Alex's phone again to retrace where he actually went during that period of time. Alex is only seen from his phone in the month of September as being on Chad Daybell's property four times. Two times he's indoors, inside the property. But on the 9th and the 23rd of September, he's outside in the backyard, according to that phone signal. And those are the only times? Yep. I think one thing that makes this case difficult for investigators is it's hard to know exactly who did what. The signals will tell you where certain devices were, but what's been probably very difficult for investigators and especially prosecutors in this case, and when people look at this and say, well, why aren't there murder charges? Because you don't know exactly who did what. Who was involved in actually laying hands on these children? That search warrant was executed at Chad Daybell's house. What did they find? Yeah, Daybell. I wanted to kind of go through what happened on June 9th. That search warrant was executed at Chad Daybell's house. What did they find? The FBI, they gridded off these areas and they start peeling away layers. This is how you do this. You just don't start digging. It's almost like an archaeological dig to a certain extent. They removed some topsoil that was right underneath the sod. Uh, which revealed three large white rocks. Underneath the white rocks was some thin wood paneling. As soon as they re removed the paneling, I could smell the odor of a decomposing body. It was a what appeared to be a small body tightly wrapped in black plastic covered in duct tape. The investigator 
immediately recognized that that well could be J.J.'s hair. So then you move on to another section of the property where the FBI is digging. Again, I think partly based on cell site hits. And they start finding charred remains. And they did exactly the right thing, and the FBI would typically do this, is they bring a forensic anthropologist with them to the scene. There was a melted green bucket. It appeared that the burnt flesh had been placed in. Under the bucket was a partial human skull. Human remains that were later ID'd through dental records that they matched Tylee. And incredibly, while all this digging is going on, Ryan, Chad Daybell is there initially. While the search effort is happening, he's actually there watching it in real time on the driveway in his car. And according to police reports, he's just sort of there continuously the whole time watching it happen. Then at one point, he moves the car across the street to his daughter's property. And then once the remains are found, he decides that's a good time to go for a drive. And literally pulls off and starts driving. Obviously, police think otherwise, and they pull him over and arrest him. But when you think about that, this is all happening in real time. And he is sitting there watching it happen and then leaves as the remains are found. You have to think those investigators were like, well, two and two equals four here. We know why he's leaving. I don't think he has any emotional connection at all what they were doing in the backyard. I think he's thinking, I'm in trouble. I got to get out of here. I got to run. I got to do something. I feel remorse. I feel emotion. Nothing. Yeah, but Andy's social personalities don't think through all that because they don't have any guilt. You know, it's like he thinks he's slick. And that basically, okay, you found these bodies here. Now prove that I killed them. And that's, you know, that's, that is where we are at this point. How sure were they at that point that when they went digging, they were going to find those children? I think they thought they were on the money. And, and another reason is I think they had totally exhausted that these kids were someplace else. They clearly were not with the grandparents of Louisiana. They clearly were not with, with friends in Arizona or, or another location in Idaho. And that this just made the most sense because just let's face it, Chad and Lori both have basically tried to snow the police, you know, deny, 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 and then come up with all these, in my view, ridiculous stories like Ty Lee's at BYU, Idaho. I mean, you can check that in five minutes you're from law enforcement. It shows you sort of the unsophistication, but perhaps arrogance on their part, that they think they could pull this off. I'm curious because you talk about Chad and his antisocial behavior. That's one person. Now you have Lori capable of being a part of this and Alex as well. How unusual is it that you would have three people capable of doing something that is unthinkable to almost every human being when it comes to children especially? They take on this attitude that we're superior to everybody else and we live in a different reality and the world's going to change. I mean, if they think the world's going to end and there's going to be a second coming and, you know, they're going to be the king and queen of England after the rest of us disappear, it's such a bizarre and such a high-risk thing to do. Do you see murder charges coming? I'm surprised they haven't come, but I think the juries are going to look at these two and say, you two are the zombies, not these kids. The only issue I have with that is prosecutors bring cases that they think in good faith that they can prove. So even if everything looks like a murder charge, they're not going to bring it unless they think they can prove it. The biggest mystery in this case is who did it? If you believe that one of these three people killed these children, who killed which child? How did they actually do it? So if you have Chad and Lori right there, will you be able to prove to the jury that Chad definitively killed Ty Lee? Not Lori, not Alex. Did Chad do it? Or did Lori do it? Or did Alex do it? That, I think, could set up some problems for the prosecutors. So while I think there could be murder charges in the future, I wonder if they're looking for something more right now to try to figure out how can I pin this on that person based on the evidence I have. If you lay out all of this behavior we've talked about today, I will tell you, working homicide cases for 30 years, it's pretty darn compelling. So what's Lori doing as investigators are digging up Chad's backyard? She's picking up the phone.
It was a year ago this month when ABC News went to Idaho with JJ's grandparents. Larry and Kate pull up in front of Chad's house. You see all this open space? What if JJ's right over there? And that actually turned out to be a premonition. Larry was right. That was almost exactly where his grandson's body would be found almost four months later. So as the police and the FBI are digging up Chad's property, guess who calls Chad from jail? It's Lori. And this is at Madison County Jail. This call is suffering and recording at an opening. This is a fascinating phone call to listen to. You know, it's just this bizarre disconnect between this flighty conversation and the worst scene that could possibly happen outside. Are you okay? And that search would ultimately reveal the bodies of JJ and Tylee. They found Tylee in parts. She had been burned. And then they find JJ. He's wrapped in duct tape and he's bound from one elbow to the other. Are they in the house? No, they're not. They're talking between the lines. They know they're being recorded. They're trying to communicate with each other. Are they seizing stuff? Again? They're searching. Logical. Let's think about what Chad said. This odd choice of words. We'll see what transpires. Is that how someone would react if they had nothing to hide? The FBI and the police show up at your house and they're digging holes in your backyard and somebody calls you? Uh, like, are you could saying things like, the police are here searching my land. I can't believe they're here. Why are they here? What are they doing here? You hear Lori, her only concern is is Chad. She asks him if he wants her to pray. She wants to know what she can do to help him. He tells her to call their lawyer. What can I do for you? I would call Margo to talk with him. Should I ask you? Should I try to call you later? I don't know. Uh, you can try, yeah. I'll reach if I can. Okay. I love you. Talk soon. That may have been the couple's last phone call. Moments later, Chad is arrested. After JJ and Tylee's bodies were identified, Lori's sister released this statement. We have prayed for the truth to come to light, but we never thought it would look like this. Tylee and JJ are completely irreplaceable in our family. There are no words that can capture this loss. Words are just inadequate. Our family will never, ever be the same. Chad prophesized that the world was going to end in July of 2020. You have to wonder how Lori feels now that Chad's prediction didn't come true. The desertion charges against Lori were dropped once the children's bodies were found, but she is still facing other charges. As of this moment, no murder charges have been filed against either Lori or Chad. At the end of the day, you want justice. They seem like they would brighten the world. You know, when you look at their pictures, just for their sake, you hope and pray for justice in this case. We should note that Lori and Chad Daybell are now scheduled to face a jury in July. Two felony charges allege that they worked to destroy and conceal evidence. Both have pleaded not guilty. And Lori Daybell also pled not guilty to contempt of court charges for not producing her children or revealing where they were. And that is the heart of this story. Those two children, JJ and Tylee. And I know you're going to stay on this, Amy. And that is 2020 for tonight. From all of us here at ABC News, thanks for watching. I'm David Muir. And I'm Amy Robach. Have a good night.